What's that guy that killed the fucking people? Jim Guyana? Jones. This Jones made these. <laughs> he goes, be careful with them. And my buddy ate two of them and we went to see the B-52s. <laughs> and he kept dropping glasses because your motor skills. Oh, my God, yeah. Look, oh, my God. People forget that. And all of a sudden, I'll never forget yelling at the bartender like, how many fucking glasses are you going to give this fucking moron <laughs> until he puts you out of business? I go, give him a plastic cup. And he goes, I'm out of them. <laughs> he goes, look at everybody. Everybody was on loots. So that when you were when there were ludes in the room, and it kicked in every fifteen minutes, you hear. Shh, <laughs> shh, shh, shh. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Greetings from Podcastville. It's Monday, the twenty second of July. Get your shit together. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by fourhims.com. Listen, let me tell you something. <laughs> With age comes wisdom, but getting older can also be a downer. In one area specifically, if you know what I'm talking about. 40% of men by the age of 40 struggle with not being able to get and maintain an erection. Why do guys turn to weird solutions? You know what I'm saying? Like liquor store stuff and, you know, stay with a big dick cream and all that. When they can turn to science and medicine instead. Expensive pills, injections, when no man wants an injection, you don't need that in your life. All right? Be wise. Check out hymns. 4hims.com is a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. And right now, today, you could try Hims today for one month for $5. Joey, what are you talking about? $5! $5! I'll give you a month of Hims for $5. We'll get you started for just 5 bucks while supplies last. Prescription products are subject to doctor approval and require an online consultation with a physician who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. See website for full details and safety information. But listen, do me a favor. Go to 4 anyway right now. Whether it's the hair products, whether it's the skin care, whether it's the sexual wellness, they got you covered. And you could try Hems for one month for $5. Go to try Hems for 4 The church would also want to welcome Dollar Shave Club. As you guys know from the beginning, we've been with Dollar Shave Club since day one. I love it. Every month I got a box in the mail with all the essentials, razors, toothpaste, shampoo, the works. With Dollar Shave Club, you get everything you need at a fair price. Now, right now, today, you can put the quality of Dollar Shave Club products to the test, all right? They're going to give you the ultimate starter set, which has basically everything you need for an amazing shower, close shave, and clean teeth. The best part is you could try to set for $5. Again, it's a $5 Monday on the church of what's happening now, all right? So do yourself a favor. Go to dollarshaveclub.com slash Joey. After that, the restock box ships regular size products at regular prices. But for today, get your ultimate starter set for $5 at dollarshaveclub.com slash church. Lee. Kick this motherfucking meal. You steal my motherfucking sunshine, Jordan <laughs> Belfort. Great to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much for taking the time my out pleasure, of your busy buddy. schedule. I know you're doing the talks and the whole thing. Uh, I have a lot of interesting people that come through here. You're a very interesting <laughs> cat. Uh, the beauty of it is that you and I come from the same cut of savagery. You said something when we were talking. You said that. We were talking about going to prison, and you said the main thing I wanted to hear. You said, I always knew I could make money. Let me ask you a personal question. Did you have a paper route as a child? Of course. Again, America, you think I'm fucking lying to you motherfuckers. To learn how to, if you didn't have a paper route, shoot yourself in of the course, fucking of head. Of course. I, that was what, part of my stories. I, I was, my first thing was going out door to door, knocking on doors to deliver papers. I was eight years old. Absolutely. And oh, how yeah. long did you deliver paper? Well, I did, so I, what happened was I did it for two years. My mom was so obsessed with growing this paper out. My mom made me sell it to someone else. So I had to sell it to the upstairs neighbor. Like, I made my first profit, $75. I thought I was the richest kid in town, right? So I retired at the age of 10, <laughs> but didn't last long. Was at 11, I started shoveling driveways after the snow. So remember, it used to fucking snow so much back in the day. Remember that? Right? Before Al Gore invented global warming, right? You used Dude, to stole like crazy. And you, know? you just went out with a shovel. You just, just knocking on people's doors, 20 bucks a driveway. People. And if I pushed you out, 
That's another 10. Yeah. And, and if you didn't fucking tip us, we're coming back with 22 we'll, shovels. We'll, the whole neighbor. The we'll bury you like it's fucking <laughs> Siberia. They won't get your car out to 2080 and shit. <laughs> Good to fucking have you <laughs> Thank on. Thank you. I could tell from your interviews and just reading a lot about your feet when the book came out that the main thing is you're a fucking salesman. You're I like am me. a salesman. We sell from beginning to end. You know that... Pacino movie is going to always be selling. Mm. That is what we do. I go. sell in my sleep. I sell in, because nothing happens until you start selling. Right. Selling's everything. You're just a regular fucking Momo. You know what I'm saying? Until you go. I think people don't realize, they think selling is just a salesman. It's the furthest thing from the truth. You know, just, it doesn't matter what you do, business or personal, you're always trying to get your ideas, your points across to people. You have, it's communication call, right? Without the ability to communicate what's on your mind in an effective way, you're going through life like barely alive. That's what I think. What was the job that made you realize you were a real salesman? Like that you could the, sell whatever the fuck you had. The meat and seafood door to door was the first real big sales job where I would go knocking on doors, uh, cold calling home to home, business to business, and selling them you know boxes of frozen meat and fish. And I just broke the company record the first day by a country mile and never looked back. No sure. What was the company record, if you don't mind me? It was, uh, they, right. were average, so they were averaging like five boxes per day. My first day, they gave me 35 boxes of meat in the truck. I sold all 35 boxes. I almost sold one woman in the truck. All right. And, and, and that first week, I sold 240 boxes. I think the average production was like 30 for the company. Was blo I blew away the company record. Blew How long did you sell meat for? So I worked for this company for about four weeks. And then I started my own meat company because I wanted my son for these moves for, right? I was like, you know, they half the time there was no f food in the freezer. So I started my. Because before that, I sold Ice's blanket, the blanket on Jones Beach. That's amazing. I heard yeah, that. But that wasn't a sale. That was just hard. Nice. Right, that was hard work. That wasn't really sales. You know what I'm saying? So when you asked about what was the first sales job, it was really meat and seafood, right? That's but that's something yeah, real quick yeah. so you would wake up in the morning go to the greek distributor astoria queens right load up four barrels four coolers white styrofoam coolers with cherry uh, lemon cherry lemon yeah, yeah lemon ice king right lemon and merinos merinos ship witches fudgicles milky way snickers fully loaded cooler cost me 22 bucks i blow it out an hour for 130 bucks so for a day at 19 let me tell you 1978 that's a lot of how old were you 16 16 yeah didn't give a fuck didn't give a fuck I was amazing. It was, it, you know, what was amazing. I'll tell you the most amazing. It wasn't the girls. It was amazing. It was that you got singles. So you know how much four hundred dollars of singles it looks is? Looks like a fucking. It's like a million it looks dollars. Like a million dollars. <laughs> that was the best part of it. You know, when you woke up in the morning, do you think of pussy or making money for it? Everything I've done was a pussy in my life. Everything, well, single you, thing. When you open your eyes and say, "God, thank you for giving me another fucking day." It's time to make money. Yeah. It's time right. to fuck somebody in the ass. It's time to make money so I can fuck someone in the ass. Beautiful. That's it. I'll be honest with you. You know, you have a... a but I'm a bit older now. Like, I don't quite you know. Right. No, I got no, a loving, lovely man. wife no, no, who's the best ever, right? But I've been married As 20. a kid, but yes, yeah, that was no. my every... I loved women since I was... I, I love women. When I was five years old, I have a, still have the scar to prove it. I was be, being chased by some little girl at nursery, and I ran into a brick wall just like that and cracked open my tw 16 stitches over my eye. All right, and ever since then, it's been downhill. <laughs> you know, you, you made a quote that I, I don't quote you, but I try to portray it as much as I can and tell people that greed is not good. Right. You know, ambition is good, but passion. Yeah. Passion. Well, when you were selling meat and beef, would you do it? I mean, you just loved it. You love getting up in the morning and that fucking challenge of closing a motherfucker. That challenge of the guy going, "I'm not interested." Hold on, wait, let, me, let me, let me, how many, how many lobster tails do you eat a month? I'm away, you know that fucking challenge of opening that fucking door. You yeah. know, I tell Lee every day, Lee, call that chick, tell her to suck your dick. She's got a boyfriend. Practice. You know what it was? I'll tell you the first. Practice. Keep going. Practice. <laughs> She'll keep saying no, but now you'll keep getting getting better at <laughs> Listen, come over and suck my dick. I can't. I have a boyfriend. Just come over for a little while. We'll look at pictures. I'll show you pictures of pugs. Whatever. You, you know, you, whatever. I've always been so. Well, like I said, she's have, I have a boyfriend that's very different. They're not interested. Right. There you go. Listen, listen <laughs> get, look, my job was always, when I first got on the phones, I was taught to, if they they're gonna buy from you either they're gonna die <laughs> change their fucking number or shoot themselves but they're gonna right. buy from you and you at first when you start selling you get discouraged when somebody hangs up on you 
my dick gets hard mm. when a motherfucker hangs up on me. <laughs> That's the guy I'm going to sell. I'm going to call him till he dies, jumps right. off a building, <laughs> or fucking, or buys. I got a lot of shit for that. I was, um, it was 23, four, four came out. I, I made this statement. I, I said, you, you don't fucking hang up that phone till the customer buys or dies. And it got printed in Forbes magazine. And it was all, it was really, I mean, it was. I got a lot of shit for that. Yeah, but Forbes <laughs> is a magazine for greedy fucking white people <laughs> yeah. that want to make money. So to say that fucking statement, it's the truth. I show. know, right? When you go in to sell anything, shoes, my sister-in-law called me last Tuesday, two weeks ago. And she's like, oh, I'm getting a job. Now, my sister-in-law and her daughter get sell. Don't get confused with that Southern draw. <laughs> they can sell. My, my niece is the number one salesman and those people that come to your house with the vacuums. The Kirby. Well, no, the other ones. Elect that, oh, oh, when, yeah, yeah, fucking, yeah. when your house burns down yeah, and your, yeah. or your grandmother had cancer and she dies, they got to clean the walls. <laughs> you know, she'll come over and sell you a paint job. Like my niece got a sudden draw and she's puts a bun on. And, right. You know, not the biggest tits. And she'll rip way, your eyeballs out. But she'll rip your fucking eyeballs out. <laughs> and now the mother is out there in the workforce and she's making appointments yeah. for a fucking insurance. Nothing more deadly than a mother daughter team. Oh, uh, yeah. So she's making appointments. So she called me and she's like, I'm having a problem at work. Can you help me out? And I call her, What's that fucking guy that we all learned from? What's the salesman the first one? Well, Zig Ziglar? Zig Ziglar. Uh, uh, he's great. Call it Zig Ziglar Dude, Jr. Zig Ziglar was great. Oh, Zig Ziglar was the motherfucker's was motherfucker. Great. Was great. So I call it Zig Ziglar. So again, she's got the record of uh, ratio, the appointment to close. Mm. She's breaking the records and appointments. But these fucking Gentiles are busting their balls. You got to put a lot more action into your into your pitch. And she, I go, are you reading from the pitch? And she goes, yeah. I always read from the pitch, and I had my own stuff. I said, you're breaking the office record? She goes, first month. They can't deal with me. She goes, I made one of the other girls quit. She thought she was hot shit, and blah, 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 blah. And I go, tell them to go fuck themselves. As long as you're selling, who gives a fuck what you do? There you go. That's my world. You got to keep fucking selling. That's what they teach you. That, that, the number one rule of a fucking boiler room or is you're going to call them till they hang up or they die, or they buy. <laughs> buy or die. <laughs> Why do you think certain people are, uh, like selling is natural for them? Because selling is not natural for me. It, 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 that, that makes me uncomfortable. All right. The, the art, selling or communication, what makes you uncomfortable? Uh, you know a lot of people of having to convince somebody of something? Not, not even just convincing, but when, you, when they say no, like be like, okay, I don't want to bother them. Like the the yeah, the idea of of selling until they either buy or die. That's how do you become a good salesman, brother? <laughs> I train salesmen. Listen, I mean it. Hunger, <laughs> hunger <laughs> makes you become hungry. You know, listen. It's, it starts with desire, pal. Right? If you if you don't have the desire, then it's not for you. But if you have the desire, anyone can learn to close. But you have to want it. You have to. You know, listen. If you're not comfortable with that, you know what? My suggestion to you is don't be in sales. Right, but but yeah. still. But that being said, you still have to know how to get your point across as you move through the world. You live a disempowered life. So, you know, it's not you don't want to convince someone of, of buying a fucking vacuum cleaner. But what do you have? How about are you having problems getting laid? Well, there you go. I mean, we, 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 who knows what it is? You have to convince people of things every fucking day. Negotiation. I, my, the toughest sale I ever closed was my wife. Seriously. Right. I had to hunt her down. I was like a freaking, I was like a stalker, almost close to a stalker with her, okay? And it was pretty close. It was like a fine line, you know what I'm saying? But the point is, is that, you know, it's not just, you think it's selling, is, he's talking hard sales, right? Sell, selling is in everything. You got to be a pastor selling your congregation, a lawyer selling a jury, a teacher selling the kids on the value of education, a mom and dad selling their kids on the value of making their bed. A comedian selling material. Yeah, you got It's everything. Yeah. Sales is everything. Do you know, sales you, is you know the Terry Winter? Yes. Terry's a friend of mine. He wrote the, the right, screen, right, right? right? Terry tells a story how he broke into Hollywood without his ability to communicate and sell and persuade. He would never been, and he's a brilliant guy. Here's what happens. Take 10 brilliant people with the same level of talent. You know who's going to win out? The guy who can communicate, sell, explain his ability to close. To, so you get a, what's, what's the value? So I think you have a negative anchor towards selling. And, you know, you can confuse that. If you don't want, think of it differently. Think of it as communicating effectively, right? Well, oh no, I'm not negative about it at all. I wish I was better at it. But you, I, like, you can get better at it. 
Well, then, well, the, what do you, why do you think you guys, it came so naturally to them? Because some people are natural born closers. They're all, like every, for every Joey Diaz and Jordan Belfort, there's a million people who struggle with it. But the beauty is, is that you could teach anyone to become a successful salesperson, right? I'm not saying I'm going to make them into me or him, but I promise this. I could take any person that wants it and make them good enough so it doesn't hold them back in life. That's the point. It's, I was a pussy about it at first. I didn't like it either. Uh, listen, I, 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 like I, 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 won't, I think that I would be lying if I said that I loved rejection. I don't think anyone likes rejection. But to me, I reframe it in my head as a game, all right? So the first day I went out, I was trained in that meat business. I watched the guy knock on 50 doors and strike out, and the guy put his head down and lost his state of certainty. And I'll never forget that. It really impacted me. And I would, for me, it was like, if I'm knocking on doors or picking, no one's by, I am just fuck. I said, I am not going to fucking stop for, for my own personal fucking standard until I get someone. I know that, look at it this way, right? If I know my ratio, say I know if I make 200 calls, you know, over time you keep track, right? I make 200 calls a day, I'll close 10 people. I'm just making up a number, right? So every time someone says no, I just made money. Because I know what that's worth to me. If I, can, I, get, I get paid for no's and yeses. It doesn't matter. It's a numbers game. I've been, you understand? I'm one that's what, boom, I just made 20. Oh, thank you. I'm like, hey, thanks for fucking saying no. You just made 20 bucks off you. It doesn't matter who. If you said it's a numbers game sales. That's what people don't get. People say, oh, sales isn't numbers. Yes, it fucking is. You know, it's a numbers. The more times you mm -hmm. cast your paw in the ocean, the more people you're going to catch, so to speak, right? Now, obviously, you have to also know how to close the deal, right? Because the worst, what happens if you don't know how to close, here's what happens to a lot of people, right? Is that if you can't, the worst thing for any human being is to try to play that numbers game. But even when you get someone who can who will buy, you can't fucking close them. Then what's the point of doing it? But when you have the power and you know you possess the ability to close anyone who's closable, that doesn't mean you close everyone. You close anyone who's closable, you'll want to bang away because you know every single time you pick up the phone where they say yes or no, you're making money. That's the point. I had a friend, you know, when we're all 18, everybody wants to go out and get a piece of chocha. And I had a friend <laughs> that every time he went out, he got a piece of it. Of course, right, yeah. That's a different, that's a, I ultimate, mean, it would destroy the ultimate cell. Everybody would go home with their head down, and this guy would always leave with some fucking skank that was ready to fuck. And the next day, he'd show up with Polaroids and a lighter up his ass. And, you know, it was just. <laughs> and he wasn't even probably the best looking guy, right? No. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And I know. It's not about that. This, this would be. And one night, I go, enough is enough. Here I am with a pocket of blow, quaaludes. <laughs> This, that, I Quailers. can't close, talking about I can't oh, close boy. this fucking savage. But he's over there closing with a quarter ounce of Coke, with a quarter gram of Coke in his pocket. He's closing the hottest bitch in the bar. And I started shadowing him. And he, what he, what what would come out of his mouth was atrocities against <laughs> Milanovic. What's that dude? It was like, he could, they could have they thrown him in jail next to fucking the worst people. But he didn't fuck around. And his percentage was higher. When he got through with them, they fucked him because he let them know right from the start. And I would hear him like, listen, let me ask you something. You're over there talking to this fucking Jordan guy. What, are you crazy? I got an ounce in my pocket. I put a rock in your asshole and suck it out. And their faces <laughs> would turn pale. And next thing you know, they would be getting their purses <laughs> and leaving. Or they would tell him he was a pig and walk away from him. And then all night he would send them drinks and apologize to him. He had eight of them working at one time. <laughs> so one of them was going to go home with him. He would have three bitches. And all, all of them, the opening it's a numbers line, game. Man. All of them. He would tell them, I got a Coke rock I want to put on your clip. <laughs> I want to put alka seltzer in your pussy and suck it off. Their faces would melt. <laughs> but he didn't give a fuck. He was closing. He closed them at the bar. They knew they were sucking his dick. <laughs> there was no, let's go home and listen to Burt Backrack and you know, drink and tell each other stories. No, we're coming on my house to fuck. The fuck. And I started doing it the first year. It, it didn't work out too much. People <laughs> called 911 and shit like that. <laughs> but now my percentages went up. There you go. And I don't mean to be rude. You know, when you're 24, that's what you're living for, is to go out and pick up women and, you know, whatever, have a good time. But it was the same thing. It was what would he would come out of his mouth was fucking, and he needed cocktails, though. He was very shy, yeah. but he was American Indian. Well, nothing's better than fucking Quaalude for that. Yeah. We used to call them courage pills. <laughs> oh, please. Please. If those things would sink in, they'd be tremendous. Hold on. You could but, do anything. Before we get to the Gorilla Biscuits, when when you go to Hawaii and you learn Hawaiian Kempo, 
they'll teach you a punch, right? They'll say, okay, you're going to punch Lee in the, in the head. But before they teach you how to punch him, they teach you how to strike him in the head with a collie stick. Then they teach you how to stab him, and the final move is the punch. Okay, so you learn all four, three phases of that move. You went from selling door to door and the beach. because, And then you went... So you went from belly to belly sales, right? And then you went into a boiler room. Mm. What was the difference now between those two? Yeah. Well, there's I, no difference. Well, I guys was, like I, you and me. But explain. I was shocked. Well, I, I when I was in the meat business and I had heard my business was going downhill, wasn't working out right because I made a lot of mistakes and wasn't doing. I was just my first time as, as an entrepreneur. And what happened was my friend had said, oh, I heard you know, people are making money on Wall Street, and he wanted to get a job there. And What year is this? This now? is 1986. And um, yeah. and, and what happened was he said to me, yeah, they, I said, well, what do they do? He goes, well, they, you know, they, they get wealthy people, give the, I didn't know, I was from a poor family, right? They get wealthy people to give them money, and I assumed, so what do you go, door to door? I, I assumed you'd be knocking on people's doors, I, as I was trained in door to door sales. He's like, no, no, they call on the phone. I'm like, How's that? I, I couldn't imagine it when I heard about it. I was like, what do you mean? You, you just call him? He goes, yeah, you call him on the phone and they send money. I was like, no fucking way. I was like, he goes, yeah, yeah. And that was like a, a very casual conversation. Anyway, that was it. Then all, we went, you know, our business went down and I, you know, my car got repossessed. And I heard a story about a kid in the local area. I grew up based like Queens, right? Who was allegedly making a million bucks a year on Wall Street. And he was like the fucking door grower. I'm like, that guy's making a million dollars a year? And I... About a week later, I ran into the guy, pulled up in a Ferrari in a nice suit with a hot chick. I'm like, holy fuck, I want the, the chick to suit the fucking car. Yeah? And I said, Michael, what do you think? He goes, oh, I made a million. You know, a broker will always tell you what they made. I made a million two last year. I'll make two million. And I said to myself, what well, you probably said to yourself, that fucker can make a million, I'll make 10. That's what I said to myself. And I went down to Wall Street the next day and answered an ad at a big firm. They were hiring LF Rothschild, and I sold myself a job. And then when I, that was the first time I walked into a Wall Street board. I could not believe. First of all, the language, the cursing, the shit. Fuck, I mean, it was unbelievable. And also, they were actually calling people up randomly from all over the country that they'd never met before. And on a phone call, people would send in a million dollars. It was the most shocking thing to me that it was suspension of discipline. I would not have believed it if I didn't see it with my own eyes. That was how it was going on. So when I first saw that, I was like, for a moment, I said, well, oh, wow, I bet it'll be better even door to door. But then I saw the power of the numbers you can hit on a telephone. And I re and then it hit me and I watched these guys do it. And I was very fortunate. I, had, I was sitting, it was my desk part. The guy who was training me was a really good salesman, this guy, right? Mark Hanna. And he played by Matthew McConaughey in the movie. And and I heard him say, I'm like, holy, I'm like, that guy's good. And I hear that guy sucks, right? And I, and, and I had this ability. I knew it. So I was so sure I was going to break the records on Wall Street as a broker. And then my first day was Black Monday when the market crashed. November 17th. Yeah, October 19th, October 1987. Yeah, yeah. And it went down 508 points. The firm shut down. I was, and, that was, and that was the beginning of everything. So Now, when did you, once the, the firm shot, sh shut, shut down, when did you go start selling in a boiler room? So, well, Theoretically, I mean that was a boiler room. I was just a, it was a prestigious firm with all phones in one room. It's no difference. It was just the same thing. They were doing the exact same thing as any other phone based room, except they had a a fancy name behind it. But it was just no difference, right? So it was massive outgoing telemarketing. Lehman Brothers was doing it. Massive outgoing telemarketing from one location. How right? many guys in one room? There was fifty of the one when I was in. Fifty yelling, guys yelling, screaming, yelling, screaming, going wild. And that same exact shit, right? And then I went. And I, so when they shut down, I for I answered an ad first. I didn't even, I left the side of my book because I just you know book, I hadn't time to write it all. Right, there was I went to another firm for a few days in Jersey. Your guy, the guy you know, I walked into this place. I was like, what the fuck? It was like the mob on fucking wall. And I I worked there for three days and I left. They heard me pitch once, and they were so astonished that when I opened up my mouth to sell, because I was like eight billion times better than any guy in the room. They were like, they made me stop. True story. Maybe it was, I'll, I'll tell you the stock I sold. Some stupid company called Panther Mountain Water Park up in the fucking Great Gorge area. It didn't even exist, probably. All right, and I they were just taking this thing public, and I didn't you know it was a penny stock, right? And I wrote this script and started selling. The guy made me stop, 
And he goes, everyone listen to how this guy sells. And the next day I left. I couldn't tell. I, I knew something was wrong. It was really fucking nuts, right? And I went to work at a small Long Island firm called the Investor Center. And, there, and that was where I walked. They heard me pitching the same, as you saw in the movie, same thing. They were like, what the fuck are you doing? I had a certain way of selling, right? And, um, and the rest is history. Now, I'll slow it down if you want. But then, you know, it's the movie's pretty accurate like that. So yeah. then, now, how long did it take you to get a Series 7's life? I already had my Series 7 because when I worked at Rothschild, I was studying. I worked for six months cold calling, cold calling and i and right. i had my series seven yeah what did you think about cold calling like yellow pages? it was frustrating well i was i was cold calling of what are called d and b's gun and brad street leads it was just lists of you know of names of people or that had Who have invested already no no business that owned businesses that would do it back then it was doing it excess of a million dollars in sales that's all it was business owners right and you just cold call 300 make three to four hundred dollars a day and back then believe it or not i couldn't even i wasn't licensed and i had to say hello i missed the hand holding and passed the phone so, so for me, that was like fucking Chinese water torture, you know, to like not be able to speak. And I would just listen to everyone else. And I was like, just I'd running all the language in my head. I was like, I can't wait to get this. I'm going to fucking kill. I knew it, you know. And then when the market crashed, it was like all my hopes and dreams were dashed in like a microsecond. I couldn't believe it that day. That and It was unreal. It really was unreal. It was the month. But the reason why I said November 17th, I'm sorry, is because I got arrested November 18th, 87, before the market crashed. Yeah. And I was selling cars at that time. But Where? I was selling cars in Boulder at a Subaru dealer. It was like stealing. Right. Okay, I went from detailing cars to selling cars. I took the bust, and it was, that's when I became a salesman. Because after that market crash, everything died. And there was only two people selling cars. It was me and this guy named Stormin Norman Ouellette that was a fucking savage. He was in the halfway house at the time. I hadn't been arrested yet. And I still remember him telling me, do, do, do you see anything funny on my body? And me going, no, why? And he would put a hot water bottle in his, he would scotch tape his mother's douche bag, those hot water bottles. The rubber the 80s, ones. The yeah. rubber ones. And then he would have a valve. And just the same thing would come out of his dick because he was snorting coke all day at the dealership. So he would put the fucking fake piss in there. He would pay like 25 bucks for piss if you were clean. Like he would get it from, he finally talked to this Christian guy. Like the Christian guy would tell him, no, no, I'm a Christian, leave me alone. He finally put him together, the huh. piss. The guy was just a salesman. Hmm. And that was the first time that I started looking at people like, hmm. what the fuck are these guys doing? But before that, there was a guy named Artie Pressler from the Bronx. And he was a killer. He was a psychological salesman killer. <laughs> you know, don't ever let the customer write down the credit app you fill it out for them i want them to tell you their life story <laughs> so they get used to you <laughs> fucking asking them creepy questions he just had little fucking details and i loved all those things and yeah i wanted to be an attorney but this art this thing of fucking selling had my dick by the balls now interesting matthew mcconaughey did another movie years ago called one for the money i never saw it it was about these guys, a.k.a. Stu Finer out of Long Island and Mike Duffy that sell sports information on the phone. Mm. And it was uh, Pacino and Matthew McConaughey. And their real name were the Slopes. I went to work huh. for them out of Long Island. I worked for them in Boulder. Where in Long Island? I forget what part of Long Island they were from. They were from wherever Seinfeld was from. Syosset, well, they all went to the same high school. So yeah, so high, yeah, Jericho High School. So yeah, high school. All, well, they all went to that same high school, yeah. whatever. There was something in the water over there because a lot of my guys came from Syosset and Jericho. Syosset, whatever the fuck. And they were, they were phone salesmen that sold sports information. What year was this? This is, uh, I, I got out of prison in 89. Massapequa? Massapequa. And I went to work for them. From eighty nine, that's when Stratton was. I was surprised that I'm to ninety two selling sports. That's my hey, That was the phone. prime of Stratton. And we would call people. Uh, you know, Jordan, how you doing, Joey? D Pete Patello was my name. Pete Patello, Colorado Sports Advisors. Well, how you making out in the gambling? Go fuck yourself. Bam, call him back. Listen, <laughs> stop it. Knock it off. You're fucking taking a beat in your fuck. You know, sports betting's big now. Big now. Like, now it's now. Big. I'm yeah. thinking of doing it's more huge. things. Yeah, when it's the huge. Sports, because now that's why. And the only reason why they're making it huge is so you could go back to work. Ah. Bet you get a series because they're going to turn them into hedge funds. Mm. 
that's what they're doing with sports gambling, right? Mm. Did you hear that? No. I'm, that they're going to put in New York is makes next. Makes sense. <laughs> so they could do uh, hedge fund gambling. So you don't even know who you're gambling on. They place the bets for you or some shit. Oh, shit. That's where they're going with legalized gambling. Mm. Interesting. But to make a long story short, I was a, I was not approached directly. There was a chitter-chatter going on in my hometown about a guy who was making a million dollars a month selling stocks. I knew about stocks how I knew about, you know, pornos. I knew nothing. I knew nothing. And I kept hearing the little jingle, I'm selling coke, I'm robbing drug dealers, I'm putting, <laughs> but I keep hearing the jingle of these guys that are making money, but now they had off, all, opened the side office in Miami. I go to Colorado and I'm hearing fucking horror stories. 10 guys are going down there at a time and eight are coming back. Two of them, they weren't ever in rehabs then. <laughs> you just went and talked to your priest and right. shit, you know. Or the <laughs> rabbi, you know. I got a devil inside of me. I can't stop snorting coke and eating quaaludes. <laughs> Nobody knew about oh, rehab. What, the worst part is what you do when you're high on coke and so the uh, things that the acts that you commit. Oh my god, the, the sexual yeah. depravity. And, and forget is what you need your priest for. <laughs> like I can't snort coke and do comedy, <laughs> but you give me a line of coke and you give me a pitch and you give me a fucking <laughs> bunch of phone cards. Oh. I'll be snorting and calling people till eight in the morning. <laughs> How you doing? Have you heard of the Kennedy assassination? I mean, I will get them going on topics and then sell them. Then come back to the finger in the ass. Oh, who's gonna <laughs> so you get your Series Sevens license. When does the money start piling in? You, this is eighty seven now. Eighty eight. So, I, so I, the market crashes. Right. I start in eighty eight as a broker for this company, and I invest a cent. I broke the record. Straight away. How much money are we making at this Back time? started right. Asking. No, sure. No, seventy thousand, eight thousand a month in the beginning. That was as a broker, and then um, after like the fifth, fourth month, um, I started my own firm. So about six months in, so I was approached after thirty days to start to by a guy who said, "Hey, you know, you're the best salesman I've ever heard, best trainer or salesman." Because I was already helping him train some salespeople there, and uh, he goes, "Dude, uh, let's go partners," you know, and and then uh, he took me to see a lawyer. In Great Neck, right, and I went with him and this and you know to this lawyer. And after the lawyer called, goes, "You don't need this other fucking guy. You know more than this guy." I already been in business and failed once. Once you fail, so you learn how to do business. So I have really learned my lesson about how to start a business and run one. So uh, I made a decision to start my own brokerage firm when I was, you know, very young. And uh, in the beginning, I was selling penny stocks, right, to average moms and pops. And then I came up with an idea, and the idea I had was to cross what I'd seen on Wall Street with, some, not penny, but $5 stocks. So it was selling $5 stocks to the richest 1% of Americans. So what was happening was on Wall Street, they were cold calling the rich people. And in these little firms like that you knew about, like in, in Miami, right? They were calling average people with little or no money, but selling them 20 cent stocks. They didn't invest 500 bucks, right? So I'd watch guys bring in millions. So I came up with this idea of this middle ground of going after the millionaires, but selling them five dollar stocks, and um, it worked so well. When I and what happens, I invented a system for training salesmen called the straight line, and it allowed me to take all these young kids who couldn't close. What happens? I had one guy, my junior partner Danny, who was a you know I trained, he was a great closer. The re other guys could not close rich people. I had twelve guys. I tried everything, didn't work. And when I came up with this new way of training people of how to close, it just was like, it was a, such a profound difference that I could take any person and make them into a killer salesperson. And that was it. Then that, the next month I made, I made, I think, uh, probably four or five million bucks the next month. It went from like, it went so fast that I went from making a million dollars a year to making 50 million within six months. So just, well, how does it work? So for the people working for your uh, firm, do you get a percentage of their commission? So there's there's two ways that you make money, really three. But sim simply put, let's say a stock is trading at six dollars, okay, right, and the bid is five, and the offer is six. That one dollar is called the spread, right? The, so if a broker sells ten thousand shares at six, that's sixty thousand dollars, and that ten thousand dollar gap is the potential commission. So you would split that 50-50. You would keep five, the broker would keep five. But what the broker didn't know is I had the stock, I owned it at $2. So I made $3 below the bid. That was mine, 100% was mine. If I traded right. So if I had a supply of stocks, so the idea was how do you get a supply of stock cheap, right? So just because the stock, imagine you buy a million shares of stock. It's two. 
and you hold it and the stock goes up to five. You got a $3 million potential profit and you have to be able to sell it. When I invented the straight line system, I could get these young kids to sell to, they would call millionaires and they'd sound like geniuses and they could close them. So with that, before that, they, they couldn't with the regular sales system. So that was like the sort of great equalizer. It allowed them to be as powerful as the top Wall Street brokers in terms of persuasion. So once that happened, it just went apeshit, went crazy because all these kids who would have been working in 7-Eleven became master salespeople and they were making millions a year and I was making a million a week. It was just crazy. And it just grew and grew and grew and it was fucking insane. When did... When did you start going personally crazy? Like, when did, how old were you when you? When 27, 26, 27. It was too much to handle. 20, yeah, yeah. Listen, I come from a really good family. My parents were amazing, you know, amazing people. It wasn't, so, it wasn't like I was raised that way in any stretch. I was raised the opposite, you know? Um, I think for me, it was that I went into my adulthood with a lot of like wounds from my adolescence that I said, if I just get rich, man, I'll have fucking, I started playing on every adolescent fantasy I ever had. And I was so good at closing and training others to do, as good as I was selling, I was even better at training others to close. That was my real gift, even more, I mean, selling, yeah, but that was easy, but training others. And that, and people started calling me the king, and I couldn't handle it. I was stupid. Like you stop believing your own bullshit when you're young, right? I mean, now I'm a little older and wiser, hopefully. And it just, you know, all of a sudden, every girl wanted to fuck me, and and it just was. I was had a, it. Just it was a. It was very difficult for me at, at 25 or 26 years old to deal with that much power. And also, I think that you know what happens is a lot of people. You probably see this in Hollywood, right? Is that when you're on when you're struggling to get rich. If you're not feeling good inside, you're like, okay, well, it's okay because, you know, I don't have what I want right now. When I get rich and I have everything, then I'll feel good. So you can make sense of insecurities. You can make sense of not feeling great about yourself. But what happens when you get everything you ever wanted in life times a thousand and you still feel like shit inside? Then what do you do? That's where the fucking real panic sets in. And then enter quaaludes, cocaine, and fucking massive amounts of eating Bed, peace, and ass. Because it makes me into an animal when I do that. That's, I'm a, I'm a Jekyll and fucking Hyde. You, I'm the most normal, I really am. I'm, thank God I'm sober for 20 plus years, right? I love my wife to death. She's the best ever. Greatest woman in the world, right? You give me a fucking eight ball, God knows what the fuck I will do. I'll be in a fucking whorehouse eating and hoping they're at the period. Because I'm fucking sick. And I and by the way, anyone who's a bit of coke act knows what I'm talking about. Oh, please, it's not. I'm not crazy. It's, you know it, Joey. Right? It's crazy. It's crazy. Something wrong with the drug. It makes you a, a sexual fucking deviant. And I loved it. He knows. And I fucking loved I it. I tell him all the time, punching chicks in the stomach. I, I just making them puke. And, and when I'm not making them swallow your cum. And when and I was right, and I'm not on it, I don't. I don't have anything. <laughs> making them puke. I don't have anything Send close to that compulsion. Strong. That compulsion doesn't exist in me. It does not. But when I do coke, it's like. It really. Does. I don't know what the fuck it is, and and I I thought there was something wrong until I was everyone else is doing the same shit when they're on it. It's crazy. Like people are like getting tied up. And no, it's pulling fucking hair and choking no. women. And I want to be choked. Small. I used Choke to come me, on kill me, table. beat me. There was a chick I used to snort coke with in Aspen. I had to be twenty three. She was like twenty nine. I would come on the table and she would. I would make it suck it through a straw. Like dude. Just, Disgusting. I had a friend come on feet. He'd pay hookers ten thousand to shit in a glass table while he could look underneath <laughs> when he's on fucking <laughs> no day in the fucking life. I had a friend that came to me in ninety four. I looked at him straight in the face. I go, You still banging hookers? He goes, It's too dangerous out there. I make them jerk me off with their feet. He wasn't I can un- I can understand he that. He was driving and it makes did, perfect sense to me. He didn't miss a beat. That's why I knew he wasn't lying. It makes perfect me. sense. The when did all that, what year did all that start? 1996, to start or end? Start. Start. It started in earnest in 1990. And how many years of madness was it? Seven. Money coming in? Seven. Unlimited Seven. money. Eight, okay. eight years of unlimited you, you, you money. Eight just, years. You're just calling the guy to deliver a kilo. Eight years. Yes. You're just delivering the guy yes. to call a kilo. Yes. Why fuck around? I mean, you're just saying. Bro. I had a guy who was getting it right from the airport, pure, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at that time. But that. my big thing was quaaludes. I, I literally single-handedly cleaned out every country of quaaludes, like pharmacy. We, you know, we would go, <laughs> it's like, you know, 
every country had its own brand of quaaludes, right? So when the when the U.S. made them illegal in the late '80s, no, the early late ni- '70s, right? So when I was in college, they were illegal, but you still they were, they were gone. But it was get they were further illegal drug for sleeping, you know, in the '70s, right? They made them illegal, but they swept and took a lot of the supply, but you still had them out there for like a few more years. And then by '84. Most of the real ones were gone, but you could still get like methacetals from Switzerland, Paladin, Burma from Spain. You get um, Normanox from Germany, Mandrax from. I knew. What I, was the shit in Paris? They used to call them Paris Blues. You know, Paris 400s. What was about the quality? Pa- yeah, little... Paris 400s. Yeah, they were. Yeah, there's another. And every type of quail had its own little formulation. So some of the. What's this here? What's this? <laughs> Quaalude. To one, yeah, this can't be real though. No way. Open it up. <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. This guy's got a fucking quail. <laughs> there you go. Uh, what, I can't. I have bad eyes. My eyesight. What is this? Does when it say? The, does it say uh, Aurora on it? It's Aurora. That's the when the FBI swarmed Cosby. I knew the agent. He threw me the last three of them. Really? That no. I, that's a. That's a uh, like a, 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 a. What do you call those? What? Not a gazebo. What do they call them? A placebo. A placebo. Gazebo. What the fuck? Dude, am you I had my. Ho- I was like sweating. <laughs> oh my yeah. god! Oh yeah, <laughs> three of them. No, let, guy- let me let me listen. I I would honestly, I'm sober for as twenty years. I would yeah. take one right now. Oh no. If when you gave me a real quaalude, when? I'd have my wife tie me up so I couldn't create any damage. Because <laughs> you know what I would get? I would get phonitis. They call the phone ice because I I wanted to call everyone. I love you. I love you. She unplugged all the phones in my house, my I ex-wife. I love you, man. Oh, I love you. I love you. When I got this, there were three of them. Fuck. Before my <laughs> wife had the baby, I ate one of them one Friday night. Just just after they all after she passed out, I ate one, and I was on so much reefer and shit. I didn't even know what it was. You know, I didn't know what it worked. But I love these, the bottle though. It's fucking yeah. Classic. Look at the fucking bottle. It's yours. Take it to your office. This is fucking That's great. Mine. That's my so what gift. is this thing, though? What's in there? It's a, it's a, a placebo, whatever. Fuck. A fake one. Like Fuck. A, look at it, but it's perfect. Really? It's a dummy, but it's perfect. Go Thank give you. me 10 years of this. This is one of the nicest gifts I've gotten in like <laughs> 30 years. Please. Is this a Rolex watch? I want this, no, Joey. I that's want a, this. That's a, I a appreciate memento. you taking the time to that's come in here. awesome, by the so way. So now when... Let me show it to everybody. Hold on. This is cla- this is vintage, by the way. So these this got this label got me in deep trouble. Because yeah. It said... Because when I read... I, had this experience with the car crashes, right? Where I, I took them, they were expires, they were delayed fuse, <laughs> and I fucking just like you know lost my shit, you know. How many did? What's the most you ever did in one night? Well, I went through a. a you bat- would really do them in the daytime, at the, like I saw, watch the movie. You do all, them all the time. I would take four in the morning <gasps> before my, I would get up at like six a.m. <laughs> before my wife, so I could get my first high, go up and down before she fucking woke up. I, I, I got really bad. I was probably doing 22 a day. 20, 22, 20. And you know 20. what's so funny? How these fucking jamokes, huh? The opiate epidemic. The, what the fuck were you in 79 when we were eating Gorilla Biscuits? I still remember giving my buddy a quail and telling him, be careful. He's like, I got this. <laughs> he had a 10-speed. Yeah. The next day I saw him with a fucking cast. Cracked, yeah. And a cracked up 10-speed. Hilarious. I mean, Hilarious. You, Hilarious. You know what it was? You didn't real. You felt coordinated, right? You thought you, you thought you had it. You together. had it together. You did, and you'd be like just fucking bouncing off walls. But what they would do? See, breaking his arm, he must have really taken a fucking fall because it almost like turned. You, know, you got rubberized a bit, like you could bounce off fucking walls. You wouldn't get hurt that easily. But I'll tell you what, though, I remember in the Long L A E, New York, Long Island Expressway, right on Sunday mornings. It was a club called Infinity. Remember that? It was a fucking crazy nightclub back then with all matches. We were fucking upstairs. It was just nuts. You would see lines of cars smashed up on the highway on <laughs> Sunday morning. Everyone came home on lewds thinking they could drive and just destroy their fucking cars. Remember that? When did you start feeling the heat? First, the FCC came at you? No, no. It was SEC. FCC, I'm sorry. SEC. SEC. SEC, the yeah. Securities. Exchange Commission. They came at me early in like 90 through 94 and I settled with them. And then um, the FBI came in after, um, and because of money I'd smuggled to Switzerland. Now, in the movie, you invite the feds over to your boat. And, yeah, yeah. Is that true? No. They just made okay. Yeah. That was a good scene, though. <clears throat> no, that's a great scene. Yeah, yeah. That's something I would do. They want it because what happened? I would have <laughs> taken like, I would have, you just yeah. said it, phone well, itis. You know, I'm the type of motherfucker yeah. to take two quailers and call the FBI office. How you doing? You investigating me? That come that, on down. The, pur- the purpose of that scene was because you know the the thing was that Coleman is a friend of mine. Now the agent's a friend of mine. He's a good guy, and we speak all the time, right? And back then we had this parallel. He chased me for like seven, eight years, but we never 
we never saw each other. So it's not enough in the, for the movie. It's much better if we you get it. It was a meeting in the middle, so may increase the tension. So. Jeez. And then uh, when did you get arrested? 1998 September. They come to the house. The, the whole house. Thing, they came to my the house. Doors, not at all. They were incredibly respectful. To me, incredibly respectful. Um, I was. My, I left the house with my daughter. She wanted to go to Blockbuster Video. I'm a Blockbuster back then, right? Yes. And as I um, was pulling out, there was a car outside my at gates, and this uh, some woman goes, "Excuse me, do you know uh, where this road is?" And I was like, um, "No, no." And then another guy, I thought I was getting kidnapped. And then she goes, oh, stop now from the FBI. And she goes, listen, you probably want to drive back in and drop your daughter home. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I appreciate that. And I went in. They just they followed me in. They didn't pull any guns, nothing. They walked me in. They said, listen, you know, you're under arrest. And uh, just come into your, into your office. And I just walked in there. And they just, well, they came in. A lot of them, there to be 10 of them in the house. They did not pull guns, nothing. What was your bail? $10 million. How long did you sit inside? Two days. And then how long till you got sentenced? Oh, it was a long time. A few years. Were you broke? I wasn't, Were you broke at no, that time? No, no, okay. no. No, I wasn't broke, but there's nothing worse. I'd rather have been broke and gone to jail the next day than the slow descent into fucking hell. That's the worst part of all. Like The worst part was that it took a few years you know, it doesn't happen quickly, you know? The wheels of justice grind. No, forward. they tried to prosecute yeah. me quickly. Yeah. That's, right. I kept, That's very rare. I kept playing yeah. with it. I and kept playing it, with it, firing attorneys. Yeah, and it took a long time, and that was like the slow descent into like, and you, you couldn't restart your life, and it was pretty fat. Was the, once I got out, it was like, it was just, you know, it was right back up. When did you realize you were going in at one point? You knew from day one you were going away. Yeah, I knew it was what going away. What was your right. attorney telling you? I mean, there was no so money do some, you gotta, Yeah, you gotta do some you time, do you know? Money. But, you know, hopefully your first offense, nonviolent, you know? And, um, so I figured I'd do a few years, you know? And, uh, and you know, we had this, you know, I got I got four years, but the deductions for the drug program to go through. If anyone ever qualified for the drug program, it was me. Everyone was trying to get into that. And I was like, <laughs> they're like, I'm like a tailor made for it, right? So, so I went through the drug, got 18 months off like that, good behavior. And um, and when I got out, you know, so the, when I, I was very fortunate because as you, as you know, his friend sitting here, um, Tommy Chong was my bunkmate from Cheech and Chong. We, they put us in the same, we were in the same cell together. So when I got to jail, I'm, I'm sitting with Tommy, he's an awesome dude. You should have him on your podcast. He's, he came on. Oh, he's, he's amazing. Brilliant. He's, brilliant. he's really smart, brilliant. right? Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant guy, right? So, and Tommy's like, we tell each other stories and, I had him rolling on the floor, and you know, by the third night, he's like, "Dude, I thought you were full of shit, but my wife Googled you, and it's all true." Because you got to write a book. I was like, "Really?" Because like, you know, you don't think your own life is. This. I was like, never, "Never." I was like, "What do you mean, never. my life's really?" I thought everyone sunk yachts and crashed planes and did eight billion <laughs> drugs and made a lot of money. I, How I crazy know. is that? Right. That nothing happened for me until I told my story. I know. I, didn't. I was cracking jokes. Nothing was happening because I thought that everybody else had delivered papers. Yeah. I thought everybody else sold ices I, I, on the. I, at the beach for twenty five bucks. I it was thought, just, you know, I thought I was just a regular guy. Me too. Well, I, 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 I knew I wasn't regular. I knew we both. You, we knew we were insane. But I, I just, I guess, I, you know, when you're living it, you become desensitized to your own insanity, right? I remember this, this, this moment in my life in probably nineteen ninety six when I was living in Old Brookville, beautiful at the Gold Coast, nicest area in the world, right? Mansions everywhere, and I had a mansion. I'm in my, with my wife in the car, and we're like driving around. We're like, they must all do lewds, right? E everyone's doing lewds and coke. You don't think anyone could live, go through life sober when you're, when you're like that. Like, I convinced myself everybody else was doing what I was doing. And to think back at that moment now is pretty laughable, but that's what you do. So when Tommy said to me, you know, I've never heard of anyone living this sort of life like you've lived, I was like, well, that's a lot coming from Tommy Chong. <laughs> so that gave me some. So I started writing, and Tommy would help me. You know, he gave me a little couple of pointers, and uh, and um, I fortunately was able to crack the code for writing. I taught myself to write, and I started writing, and then people liked it. And then um, Leo and Marty, uh, as soon as the book was done, um, the rest is history. The Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, a fucking tremendous story. But a tremendous movie. I, I want to tell you, movie, there's something tremendous. incredible about Martin Scorsese that you can't quantify it or put your finger on it. But somehow he created a movie that will go down forever. It's a generational movie. 
And I don't think anyone, Leo was right, because Leo was the one who attached himself to it and it was Leo's passion project. And Leo said to me, just trust me, buddy. Marty has to, he need Marty to direct this movie. Because there was a lot of other directors. Ridley Scott wanted to direct a lot. And I was getting frustrated because Marty's very slow. You know, it took, a, it was many, many years. So I sold them the book in 2006, mid-2006. End of, the early, end of 2006, right? And it was like, it just takes forever. And, and he's like, just trust me. Let me get Marty. And he was right. I mean, Marty was able with Leo, of course, as well as brilliant. But he's got a special talent for telling a story. And I think what it is, you know what it is? I'll tell you. Is that he doesn't tell a story with judgment. The one thing I hate about the movies, I'm sure you hate this to me. Everyone, I mean, you all hate this, right? I don't want to be fucking moralized, to. Don't tell me how I should feel when I watch something. Let me fucking watch it and come to my own conclusion. I don't want a morality tale, all right? Just tell me what happened and let me draw the morality from it. And Marty put it up on screen as it was, for better or worse, without, you know, in some sort of say he glamour. Yeah, he didn't glamour. It was glamorous. It wasn't glamorizing. It was glamorous. And that's what he did. And also it was dark and disgusting, and he put that up too. That's what I enjoyed about the movie the most. It's real. I enjoyed the movie. I really did enjoy it. I put it up there with Goodfellas. It's I a great movie. movie. It was great. But what, if you tell me what's my favorite part of that movie is, he took me there. I, I exactly. I had to go to the bathroom and, <laughs> and take two bong hits and take a half a Xanax. He took me there. He yeah. reminded me of my own of that time. You know, I told you that I had the same thing. Yeah. They came. They said, do you want to sell on the phone? I you know. I was going to give it a try, but when I went down and looked and felt, it didn't feel right. Something just didn't feel right. It felt like it was too fucking easy, and it was. I I, was I, like I, yeah, I find it difficult to understand the world the way it is. I think it's so. Much, I don't. I think it's fucking crazy what's happened in the last five years with this world, with political correctness and and all this shit. It's like the. It's just. I don't know. I just think that it's a. It's a lot worse than it was in terms. Yeah, except for as it is. But I just think it's ridiculous what's going on right now. With like it, all of a sudden, like every word has to be watched that you say, and everyone's fucking sensitive, and everyone, well, everyone's being you know me too to whatever too. I, I think it's just gross. I'm an immigrant, yeah, and I'm gonna get immigrant that faced New York City. My parents immigrants in the last Israel. No, no, um, Europe, <laughs> Europe. France, and uh, Russia. I thought you were Jewish. Well, yeah, but yeah, yeah, but Fran French and Russia. Yeah. Okay, right, right, right. I thought that I'm Cuban. And when I came here, my first thing my mother said to me in 66 or 68, or one time I got the PS166, is like, look, you're going to talk English outside the house, and in the house you're going to talk Spanish. I don't want you doing that meter meter routine out there. I don't want them to look at you as weak. And I remember going, eh. and I started thinking about That's it. That's great I'm advice. I'm not sticking up to nobody. I'm not political. I got felonies. I do not want to fucking go to jury duty. I'm not sticking up for anybody, anything in particular. I was growing up on, and I swear to God, up till 85 or 86, if I was at a cafe and you and your mother were talking Israeli for more than five, six minutes in New York, somebody would come up to you and go, oh, English. Yeah. And you would go, I think it's a whatever the fuck you're saying. And they would go, go back to your own fucking country. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was well known in New York. You know, I, I, yeah, I get it, and I think that I it was just a statement in New York. It's misunderstood. It's misunderstood. What it means. I didn't get offended. Let me tell, listen, when I was a you know, kid, when you say go back to your own country, that doesn't mean. First of all, I love immigrants. We all, but come legally and also appreciate for being here. But I don't want anyone to leave and go back. But if you hate the country, you should leave the country. Why the fuck should you be if you don't love the country? Then you should get the fuck out and go back to your own country. But I'm not because anyone that anyone. I don't care what call you where you're from. If you want to be here and love this place, m for me, my door's open. Not my house, but, you know, as come here and enjoy this country and everything it has to offer. But if you want to come here and hate on this country, get the fuck out. That's my point. I, I don't care what you want. Everyone should be welcome. But when you come here, you should, you should learn to speak the language. Okay? You should pay fucking taxes. You should fucking be a uh, You know, I don't... It really bothers me the way they, the press is twisting the message. Because, you know, listen, Trump says stupid shit. I'll say he misphrases himself sometimes, but he doesn't, that his meaning is clear. His meaning is, he's not, not saying that people who are law, who, who love the country, immigrants should leave the country. But if, if you hate this country, why are you here? Very different. I think all immigrants have the right to come here legally. All right. And I welcome the fuck. My parents are immigrants. But, you know, 
it's just it's something. It's, a, it's something odd is going well, on. There's well, something very strange. I'm, just, I'm not sticking up. It's very strange going on right now. Right, I'm not sticking up for Trump or something. No, it doesn't. That's right. not what it's like about. I'm, I didn't mean that. I'm just saying that he says stupid shit. He makes mistakes. He says stupid you know, shit. I, I didn't take it personal the other day, and I've been no, hearing that, that statement. It's, 19, it doesn't mean that, since right? 1966. Exactly. I've been hearing that statement. It's been it's manipulated by the press for political reasons. Okay, and you know. He's so he's almost, he's like the unfunny comic Trump. Anyone else could say what he says and it'd be okay. He says it and it just drives people crazy. I think on some level he's doing it on purpose. To fuck at this point, he's just looking to push people. He's got to be at this point. Look, he's looking to do it because I'm like, because I'm like, oh my god. That, that, I mean, you're gonna really fall for this shit that he that he said. You guys are really gonna react. He control the news cycle again. Are you that stupid that you really are gonna write about this? It's so obvious. This he just says shit and they just. Go nuts and like it's like it's stupid at this point, you know. It was just. Oh, I'm sorry. I because it just to, to me the numbers that were thrown out in the movie were just so mind blowing. And I, I I'm not a fan of Trump personally, but can you explain the power that that amount of money gives you? Like when you were on the plane and you got tied down, like like maybe not even for Trump, but just like what that amount of money will do. It, it does and it doesn't. Okay, it's a misconception. It gives you it gives you power until it doesn't. You know, okay. it gives you power that I could fall down and, and someone will pick me back up. It gives me power if I break a small law that I can buy my way out with great attorneys. All right. But, I, you know, when you, you know, nowadays, especially we live in a different world. I don't care who you are. You know, the big you are, they gun for you right now. And everything you did becomes, oh, I have a lot of close friends that in the last few years have been really, they've taken major falls from graces for things they've done or allegedly done 30 years prior. And I have a problem with that, all right? And I have a daughter who I love to death, who, who, but you know, I have a problem with people being accused for things that are not provable from 30 years ago. I think it's just gross it's disgusting. and disgusting, and it's not fair. It's un-American. That's why I say whatever I did 30 years ago now. Yeah. I just put it out there. I don't give a fuck whether it's robbing right. a coin thing I, or a car out. One time I went into a car while I was 10 left. I fucking love car valve. Like grandma right. blow. Come on, dog. I just <laughs> went to shoot the, the Many Saints of Brooklyn, and I was in... Uh, it was Ridgewood, Brooklyn, mm. where we were shooting. And as I went in, they had a fucking Carvel that Abe Lincoln went to, I think, when he fucking <laughs> was in New York that for a short stint. I mean, and, and, and for somebody else who would have saw that, they would have gone crazy. My dick got hard. I fucking, <laughs> my dick got hard. And the next day, look at this fucking Carvel. Look at this Carvel. Wow. It's a shack in Ridgewood right there. No, it's not even, it's not even, it was like three blocks before you get to Ridgewood. Unbelievable. It was fucking old. So the next day, I see a Bank of America. Look at it from the side. The next day, I'm in my fucking trailer, and I, I go, what, what, what the fuck am I doing in this trailer? Let me go take a walk on this Myrtle Avenue. And I didn't walk 50 fucking feet. And what's there waiting for Papa? A brand new Carvel, like the new state of the art ones. <laughs> and, I, and I saw two Chinese chicks in there making fucking shakes. And I'm like, oh, we're going to have a problem. Because they bought them as an investment. It's not like the old guy with the missing foot. Where we were kids, he had the Carvel because he loved Carvel. His wife right, had diabetes. Right, 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 right. The kids were fat. Right. The one kid lost an eye when he was eight from eating so much Carvel. It wasn't an investment. But it was all good, though. If you go to the Carvel in Santa Monica, yeah, yeah, in Culver yeah, yeah. City, it's an investment. Yeah, I get it. You yeah. walk in there, and you feel like you're getting raped. 480 for a cone. Yeah, yeah. And then you go to the guy, you from New York, the guy's like, no, nah, I'm from Iowa. You don't have the right to sell Carvel, yeah, bitch. Yeah. You got to earn that right yeah. for your fight, the party. It's like, it's like lemon ice yeah. of Corona. Yeah, like right? lemon ice of Corona. You know, there's just certain things. So I went in there, and I go, the lady comes up to me, she said, can I help you? And I went, I went, you know me. I open up with a double cone, vanilla chocolate, and color with sprinkles okay. of whipped cream. Oh, yeah. I was telling them, and I get a chocolate shake, very thin, and then dip it, and then eat it. That's you know, how I grew up, dip know, it. There's a place in the village my daughter threw me to called Two Gay Guys. It's a gay ice cream. Big gay ice cream? Big gay ice cream. Yeah, I've seen that. How cool. It was fucking good, by the way. They, they, they do the call bells. I, I thought it was going to be something different. I thought it was going to be like scoop ices, and she's like, oh, it's so, oh, so good. Big guys, come right. I walk in, they fucking car bell dip. I fucking, that's the best. And see there, <clears throat> the owners, you get it? It's like a fucking family thing. I there. need a family. Right, no. The if people that work there, are just like, it's their fucking thing. Yeah. 
Very cool. I want to go to a club. People line up way. around the block for big ice cream. It's yeah, the little. mother weighs 800 pounds. No, it's like all <laughs> The kids are 400 It's just pounds. right. It's a fucking real thing. The it's real. The father's on roller it's skates. Real. Yep. He lost a foot to diabetes. Exactly. That's and a it, Carvel owner. And they keep eating Carvel even in spite yeah, of all. no yeah. matter. Exactly. I, in fact, I bought the milkshake. I ordered a large, and I looked at the Weight Watcher points. And I go, fuck. <laughs> I better just get a small. And I took three sips out of it, and I threw it away. But. <laughs> I did buy two things of flying sauces for the girls on the set. Remember the Carvel trucks that used to oh go by? Oh, my God. Oh, my Mr. God. Softy? Mr. Softy Mr. Softy Mr. fucking shit. Softy, right? That was my shit, too. So 2000, <laughs> when you get arrested? When do you turn yourself in for prison? 2003. Four, four. When do you come out? 2000, end of 2005. How are you feeling? Ripped. In good shape. I came out in really good shape. <laughs> and with, and with uh, a book... 150 pages of a book. I threw it away, but I taught myself to write. So I learned this skill while I was away. And I came out and started writing. What were you thinking about the outside when you came out? What were you thinking? How were you were going to get treated? Just one of my kids. No, I didn't care about I had never worried about that at all. And how old is your daughter that you speak of? No, she's 26. And she's the one from... She just graduated from uh, grad school at MIU. She's uh, really successful. Like my son's a rapper. My other son's a businessman. Works for me. If three kids all together. And this is with that first wife? Two. The blonde in the movie. The she's husband. my second wife. Okay. I have two, and then I have a stepson with my current, who is like my own son. You know, same thing. And uh, so he works for me. And uh, I'm very... My, all my, my second kid is, is a rapper, hip-hop. And he's going to be famous. He's a really talented. And uh, so he's awesome. All my kids are, I'm very fortunate. But for me, when I came out, it was all about my kids. I came out, I didn't speak to an adult probably for, I mean, more or less for like about a year. I, I holed up in a little tiny ap apartment in Playa del Rey. I had no money. And I started writing that book. And my kids would come over and they'd say, shh, daddy's writing, you know? And I, and I said to my daughter, I said, I'm going to write a bestseller and become famous. You know why I said that, though? Because I I never believed it because I was scared I wouldn't finish. So I told her so I wouldn't let her down. I, I said, I'll never let my daughter down. So I used it as a way to motivate myself, especially when she told my ex-wife that I really had to fucking do it, right? So, so I had no choice but to finish this book. I told my daughter I was going to be a famous writer because I was scared I would never finish. I, I, I was, so I did that to motivate myself. And I finished the book in about 10 months. But by the time I was on page 12, I had sent it to an agent. I just you know knew very casually and he read the page and he was like, he looked, he said, did you write these yourself? I was like, yeah. He's like, holy shit. He goes, I thought Tom Wolfe had written them because I had modeled Tom Wolfe. I learned to write like Tom Wolfe or at least tried to. And um, he goes, write 10 more pages. I wrote 10 more and I sent him those pages. He goes, stop everything you're doing. He goes, you don't understand what's about to happen to your life. His name is Joel Goller. And I said, what? He goes, you're not, you don't know. He goes, this is gonna be the biggest book because Leonardo DiCaprio is going to play you and Marty Scorsese is going to... I swear to God they said this in on page 22 of the book. I thought he was out of his mind. So I just literally didn't work. I stayed... I holed up in my... in his little apartment for about 10, 11 months and I wrote 1,200 pages and I, and Random House and they sold it to... I got, it got bought by Random House right with it after the 30 pages. So I had money. I, you know, I had some money at least to live. And um, I went through seven edits on the book to go from 1,200 down to 528 pages. And um, and yeah, and as soon as the, that magic was done, the, you know the first guy to latch on? Wasn't Leo, he was second, Terry Winter. And it's Terry, once Terry, from the Sopranos, right? And Boyle Camp, but once he said, I have to adapt this, everyone, Leo, it was like almost like Leo came on board and Marty came on board. And then, then came the slow Marty hell, because Marty's just slow. You still talk to Terry? Terry, I just texted him today, by the well, way. Tell him I sent yeah, him I just, my love. Yeah, and tell him to, I sent him a text today. Don't forget about yeah. me for he's a nocturne. He's an amazing, Terry's really. He's, he's writing this thing now. He's so, he's a That's, great, he's he, such a great writer. He took T.J. English's book and re-put it into, I have not read the script, but I have heard the stories. Ooh. Apple TV <sighs> bought it. So Apple's been breaking his balls too much. Fidel, not enough Fidel. Some shit's going. Let me just tell you about Terry. Terry's life. brilliance. I know it is. He has no ego. He, I he loved my book, and he took my book and somehow formulaically turned it into a movie script. He didn't try to make it Terry Winter's version of my book. 
He took it, and he's, just, he's a brilliant guy with no ego. And his first draft was perfect. The movie that you saw was like his first draft, more or less. It's unbelievable. So, and then Leo came on. So once that happened, that was an unbelievable turning point in the movie, for, in my life. And once Leo and they all came on board, it was announced publicly that it got bought out. So then Random House immediately exercised an option for a second book. So I, I wrote this part two to the book. And then what happened was they had greenlit the movie in 2007. Then the writer's strike hit and it got delayed for five or six years. I was devastated at the time because I said, oh, my God. Oh my. And I tried to be the best thing ever because what happened was during those five years, I became wealthy again. I made back my money and started speaking and teaching sales around the world. By the time the movie came back around, Leo came to me and goes, what happened? How would you get Richie? I, I told them and they changed the entire third act of the movie to – have my comeback in there. The first version didn't have my comeback. It had me ended up in jail. So they ended up with me on stage speaking. It was unbe- So it turned out to be this unbelievable thing. I, I think the, the thing to learn from that is you could change your life story. Like While they were making it, I changed my own life story. You, it's never too late to change your story. If you put one foot in front of the other and work your ass off, you know? You're a dangerous man. <laughs> and uh, it's funny, when I went to Wikipedia... You know, I went to your website and stuff, and not to embarrass you, nothing like that. It's not my style. Uh, I'm just saying this because this is how I feel. And I, you and I share a certain bond, and it was that it said celebrity net worth minus <laughs> yeah, yeah. eighty million dollars. You're like minus yeah, eighty yeah. million. But what life doesn't know is that's how you want it. <laughs> You've always been a, an underdog, <laughs> and you made yourself a favorite. <laughs> In fact, the best work you do is when you're a fucking underdog. Uh-huh. You're like Joe Montana when Dallas came. <laughs> Remember Dallas marched into San Francisco, yeah. given a point in 82? Like, we're going to fuck up Joe Montana. And Joe Montana said, bitch, you're coming into my house. You always live your life like it's your house. Mm, I'm lucky I have a rich wife. Really? <laughs> She's rich? She's my partner. The partners. But she was rich before you met No. Her? Okay. The partners. Right. I get what you're saying. No, no, no. We all, no we're really partners. No, I know. She I know. really started my business with me, and she put her own money in to start the business, and, and she works with me every day, and, and I'm very fortunate because she's brilliant. So we're partners, yeah. No, you're a lucky man. I am a lucky man. You're a man. bad motherfucker. You're a <laughs> I mean, when I read all that stuff, uh, like I read about you first. Somebody mentioned you somewhere, if I, and I did not read your book. I've seen the movie three or four times, but I've not read the book. Now you're going to force me to read the fucking book. I think you'll enjoy, it's written in a way that you will yeah, love. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you'll like it. I love it. everything about you. Well, it's not, no, it's written in the voice. <laughs> you'll like it. You know, it's the crazy thing about anybody give you any shit? No. For what happened over those years with the. No. It, you, you did your time. Yeah. You did your thing, and now you're ha- you look happy. Yeah, you no, it's not like healthy. that. You don't believe, you know, you don't, do you don't really believe what you read in the newspapers? You know better than that. No, right? no, no, no. I'm it's just all talking, nonsense. So I'm like, about, I know when I got out of prison, I felt weird for a while. I felt weird. Uh, you know, there it's, was a couple it's a of good months point. there. So that's what I'm trying to get from you. What I'll tell you what it is. It's not that I, in the beginning, when I first when pu- my life became <clears throat> public again, and they would say things about me that I stole this money, and it would make me feel bad inside. It would. Because I'm a good person, and I and I regretted doing what I did, and I got to a point. Well, a I've done so much good in the world in the last ten years and helped so many millions of people. But that's not doesn't matter of offsetting. But I started to realize that no one gives a fuck about it except a few journalists. That's it. A few idiotic journalists. Then keep. Fighting. By the way, I appreciate the hating. You know why? Because it makes me a lot of money. The haters. It increases my engagement online. So all you fucking haters, keep on hating me because you took pour it on. Because what you start a conversation, my fans can react, and then it creates engagement, and boom, it's awesome. So I don't resent it. But here's the thing: I made mistakes. We all make mistakes, and you know it's what you do after you make mistakes that's how you define. And I think I define my life in a in a very empowering way that in a way that empowers many millions of people around the world. About 10, probably more than that. hundreds of millions of people are empowered by my life story thanks to the movie and the work I do in terms of training and 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 teaching people about entrepreneurship. So I think that's the gift I give the world is that. The movie's funny, it's great, it's awesome, it's a great story for everyone, but the gift I give the world is the ability to understand that no matter where you are in life, 
It doesn't matter. You can come back as long as you want to work hard, learn strategy. It's got to be strategy, strategy as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Please. You got to know what to do, something. right? But if, if you want Everything to Everything I move is strategy. Yeah, Every yeah. fucking move exactly. I make. Yeah. Every time I leave the fucking house, yeah. it's thought out. And, 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 and it doesn't happen. when People don't get that. And of course, like whenever I see a successful person, you would think that, is it luck? It's fucking strategy, strategy. and hard work. And hard work, the intersection of that, and a little bit of luck. And the harder I work, the luckier I get. The luckier you get. There you go. Brother, it's been a pleasure. My, it's been my on. pleasure. I'd love to have you on my know. show as well. I just whenever thought you it, want, you would be great. Whenever my you want. fans just, will love you. <laughs> just fucking contact me, and I go down there. We'll speak. We'll talk I live stocks. on the beach. You'll love it. So we have, yeah, I'm on, right okay. on the ocean. Yeah, you'll okay. love it. I was just down in Huntington. I took my family down there for 4th of July. Uh, so when the hat beach those close. Weeks. Yeah. And I, you know, I love it down there. It makes you, you know, growing up in Jersey and New York, Every, every impression you get of California is chicks on the beach with bikinis, and then you get here and you find yourself living in fucking Hollywood, <laughs> and you never go to the fucking beach until one day you go, fuck this. I'm going to start to go to the beach more, and that's what I've swore yeah. to do, and uh, you've been an inspiration to me Thank today. you, my friend. I think you are an inspiration to a lot of people, and I want people to know that second chances are fucking real. You just got to do something with the fucking There thing. you go. Don't forget, you filthy fucks. I'll be at the D.C. Lincoln Theater August 9th. That's all I got for you right now. Go to the website, uh, and that's it, and that's that. Now for a word for our sponsors. Again, I want to thank Jordan Belfort for being a tremendous fucking guest. I want to thank the Christ Killer. But most importantly, I want to thank you motherfuckers on a Monday morning because you're going to have the week of your goddamn life. Before we leave, I want to talk to you about a little something. The Dollar Shave, uh, the Church of What's Happening Now is sponsored by the Dollar Shave Club. I've been a Dollar Shave Club member for years. You guys know that, and I love it. Every month, I got a box in the mail with all the essentials, razors, toothpaste, shampoo, the works. It's a no-brainer. No more running over to the drugstore to pay premium for things you use every day. With Dollar Shave Club, you get everything you need at a fair price. And Dollar Shave Club is way more than just razors, all right? They got you covered from head to toe, everything you need. The shower. They got to shave, style your hair, brush your teeth, and even wipe your butt with one wipe Charlie's. You got to keep that muffler clean. It's summertime. But that's not all. Smelly, throw in some sea spray deodorant. Frizzy hair, they got pomade, hair cream, hair gel, and hair paste. You got no excuses. You got a hot date, they even got cologne. And you can try it all with their specialized trial kits or the combination that works for you. Plus, they'll keep you stocked on a schedule that works for you whether that's once a month or a few times a year. And right now, you can put the quality of Dollar Shave Club to the test by going to dollarshaveclub.com slash church. You understand? me? Listen, they got the ultimate starter set that basically has everything you need for an amazing shower, close to shave, and clean teeth. And the best part is you can try each set for $5. $5. And after that, they restock box, the restock box ships regular size products at regular prices. But get your ultimate starter kit for $5 at dollarshaveclub.com slash church. C-H-U-R-C-H. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash church. The church is also brought to you by 4 Hims connects you with real licensed doctors and FDA approval pharmaceutical products to treat ED. Joey, what are you talking about? Listen. With age comes wisdom, but you're getting older, and it can be a downer because I'm from time to time. You know what I'm talking about. 40% of men by the age of 40 struggle with not being able to get and maintain the stick of debt. Why do you guys turn to weird solutions? You go to a liquor store, oh, I'm buying a bottle of tequila, let me try these pills. When, they can, when you could turn to medicine and science. Expensive pills, injections, when no man wants an injection, give me a breather. Listen. As far as I'm concerned, I knocked up my wife at 50. The helmet's working fine, but from time to time in the middle of it, sometimes you drift and the helmet gets a little soft. Be wise. Check out Hims. 4 is a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. All right? Hims connects you with real licensed doctors and FDA-approved pharmaceutical products to treat ED. See results where other treatments fall short. Listen, stop worrying about multiple in doctor visits, no painful injections, and it's easy. You answer a couple of questions about your medical history, you chat with a doctor for a confidential review. If you're approved by the doctor, bam, the products are shipped directly to your door. Being, being your best means performing your best. 
It's erectile without the dysfunction. It's hard made easy. Say hello to your little friend. Listen, try hymns for a month for five dollars. We're gonna get you started for just five dollars while supplies last. Prescription products are subject to doctor approval and require an online consultation with a physician who will determine a prescription that is appropriate for you. Who's better than fourhims.com? Nobody. See website for full details and safety information. Go to fourhims.com right now. And you're not going to be sorry, all right? So I gave you Dollar Shave Club and fourhims.com. I'm taking care of you. I'm watching you. Don't forget August 9th, Lincoln Theater, Washington, D.C. August 13th, Majestic Theater, Dallas. August 14th, the Aztec Theater in San Antonio. I don't know if there's tickets left. Go take a look. I don't know what the hell to tell you. All right. Have a great week. Enjoy the podcast. Wash your pussy. It's going to be a hot one to drink water, motherfuckers. Uncle Joey here. Stay black. Have a great fucking week. Kick this motherfucking mule, Lee. A little something from me to you guys. All right.